It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Our guest today is CEO Tom Dixon. Tom started a business called Harvest House Food and Grains that specialized in creating safer packaging for wheat. One day, he spilled some grain and found when he sucked it up with his vacuum, it acted as a wheat grinder. That was the beginning of the magic mill, which would later lead him to make blenders and starting Blendtec, where he is still CEO today. Tom Dixon, welcome into the corner office. Thank you. Good to be here. Let's kind of start with your early years. You know, what were they like uh, growing up in the Bay Area and what were you like as a kid? Yeah, well, it was great. I mean, I grew up in the 50s and the early 50s, and actually we moved from, I was born in San Francisco, moved to Menlo Park, the country, uh, in 1951. And uh, the year, it was wonderful, perfect weather. Hard to imagine that Menlo Park was in the country then, but I guess that's what it was, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. But I had a I had a sheepdog that my dad, a friend of my dad that worked at Hewlett Packard, won at a poker game in Reno, and so grew up uh, herding my my ducks and we had uh, 105 chickens and we grew <laughs> fruits and vegetables. So it was great growing up. A lot of farmland out there then, or what was the, uh, what was the area like? Uh, pretty wild. <laughs> well, you know, we, we bought, um, we bought this little house and behind the house was some landlocked property. And so my dad bought that for $300 there's, oh now, there's now a four million. There's two four million dollar houses on it. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, he bought that, and then we he got the neighbor to tear his garage down, and so we had easement to that the acreage in the back. So that's where our little farm was, and that's where my racetrack was around two big oak trees that were hundreds of years old. So that's where I got started on uh, racing my my car around the when I was 12 years old. I bought <laughs> my first car for for um, $25 in 1932 Chevrolet. And so that was my first car. And in that same year, I bought a, for $13, bought a 40 Oldsmobile. So those are my <laughs> cars that I raced around the dirt track in the backyard in Menlo Park. Wow. Hard to imagine. And what about um, entrepreneurial things? Any things you were involved with, uh, in either leadership roles or, you know, uh, doing business or starting business when you were a kid? Yes. Um, I really, I, from when I was very young, I was um, I was uh, buying uh, or building go karts and motorcycles and so on. Um, I held a record in uh, uh, in Fremont, California, all of Northern California, drag racing motorcycles when I was fifteen and a half, fifteen and a half with a learner's permit. So I bought and sold uh, cars and motorcycles and go karts, and but really um, I started. I was. Uh, I, I was not a real good student and I know, and, uh, at all. And so I ended up, uh, I went to Woodside High School and there I took a machine shop class and I was the only, I already had a lathe. When I was eight years old, <laughs> I had a lathe in my garage. My dad uh, was one of the early employees of Hewlett, Hewlett Packard. And so he worked for Dave and Bill in 1951. Wow. And so he was a tool and die maker. Was your and, dad an engineer as well? Does that kind of his background? No, he was more of a he was an inventor, but a, okay. more of a you know machinist, tool and die maker, and had no interest in management uh, leadership. He was 
um, constantly approached by Dave and Bill. And, you know, you, you need to be a, to run the shop and do this. My dad had no interest in, in leadership, only in being one of the guys and inventing and coming up with new processes and, and, uh, uh, and things to keep, you know, to get Hewlett Packard up and up and running in the first building on the Page Mill Road in Palo Alto. So wow. that was the beginning. So that's been very exciting. Yeah. But, so so you mentioned uh, studies weren't your favorite um, modus operandi during your school years, uh, other than racing your go karts and cars. What are they the kind of things you were doing outside of class? Yeah. Well, I and I had a hard time because I'm both uh, I'm both ADHD. D and also dyslexic, which they couldn't define back then. So right. I, di- I didn't really have a chance of sc- scholastic success. I couldn't even <laughs> read. I was a horrible student. But w- yeah, what I did all day is just think about and design and, and all through grade school. And, you know, what am I going to do when I get home? And so I would lay out uh, go-kart uh, designs on the, on, the, on the concrete in the garage and bend up tubing, fill tubing full of uh, sand and plug it up and bend it and weld it together and and build various you know go karts and motorcycles and so on scooters, and so that's how I really got started. So, but really, I I was the only one in high school that could run certain machine tools in my regular high school at Woodside, and then because of my lack of and all the classes I took in high school were remedial, remedial world backgrounds, remedial right. history, remedial English, and. So I really had a struggle. And so for that reason, they put me off in a different school for half a day. And that was a real blessing because I, I went to Sequoia High School in Redwood City. Right. And that was kind of a precursor for Stanford. It had a, it had a bell tower. I mean, it was a lot like a miniature Stanford just between Stanford and, and San Francisco. So that was wonderful. To this day, I mean, there's no machine shop uh, for high school kids in the world. No. Like like this shop. And so I was able to get some of these and I was there three hours a day. So I'd ride ride my fast motorcycle, my six (laughs) fifty triumph, you know, to school every morning really early and then spend uh, three hours there. And what I did is I organized a bunch of young guys that wanted to make a half a dozen guys that wanted to make some money and they really stood out in the class. So we'd get together. And we'd do the whole year's worth of projects in about two weeks. Nice. And nice. then, and so I did this for several years. And so then um, what I do, what I was doing with these guys is we're building motorcycle parts. So motor mounts and rocker cover covers and pegs and all sorts of things for racing motorcycles. And then I sold those to a local motorcycle shop, oh. Motorcycler and others. Great. And so that was sort of. And then I would share the wealth with the guys that were helping me. But we just felt like we we're doing some worthwhile things instead of just making screwdrivers and hammers. And <laughs> at the same time, I was built. We were buying castings and uh, making drill presses and another thing along things along that line. And also, we had lays from naval ships where we could turn 15-inch mag wheels. Uh, magnesium wheels on lathes. So these are huge pieces of equipment, right. as well as you could put four engine blocks on a planer and plane and plane engine blocks. So there's no shop in the world for kids any age. What yeah. a blessing. So that turned, yeah, what a blessing. Of course, that. I, I want to go back to something you mentioned about being uh, ADHD and dyslexia. You know, it's uh, very common that several entrepreneurs have had that uh, as a disability and uh, have gone on to do great things. Paul, Paul Orfalo is a good friend in Santa Barbara, the, for, the former founder of Kinko's and, of course, now uh, sold it on to uh, to FedEx, uh, suffered from both. And, you know, you meet him and you know it. Yeah. <laughs> He's definitely got that type of personality. How did you overcome that? You know, it must have been difficult. Obviously, having the Sequoia School sounded like it was a very um, uh, helpful thing, right? Because you could focus on your vo- vocation. But, you know, as you said, you were well ahead of the diagnosis. Uh, uh, was that discouraging to you? Did it did it give you motivations in order to succeed? Tell me a little bit about your thinking as, as you struggle, obviously, as you must have uh, with, with both those disorders growing yeah, up. Yeah, it was a real, uh, yeah, nobody understood it back then. And I spent a lot of, a lot right. of time uh, in the corner of the, of the classroom. <laughs> so, but it's, it turns out to be a real blessing when you understand it. And as I travel the world 
and find other people. A good friend is David Nealman, the founder of JetBlue. And uh, we, we've been yes. involved in his More Good Foundation for the last 11 years. But so different people like that. So it turns out I see things like nobody in the world sees. I mean, even yeah. you know, with our 40 engineers, you know, I'll come up with some ideas I did nine weeks ago at four o'clock in the morning. And I, you know, <laughs> and I sketch it up and I come in and I try to explain it sometimes to the engineers. And they don't quite get it. You know, I have to either print it up or, you know, really draw it up and, and after go back to the lathe and make it and make it. And I, (laughs) and I'm still, we're actually using when I made that mill almost 40 years ago and put 40 companies out of business that were making home grain mills and the mill that weighed one eighth as much, took up one eighth the space, put out flour twice as fine, twice as fast and put 40 companies out of business that made stone mills. And now I've done 50 million in sales off from that mill. But that was something awesome. that, you know, I'm just everything totally outside the box. But getting back to the, the, the ADHD and dyslexia, I mean, it's it turns out, I mean, it was tough going through to high school, yeah. reading only two books, T-Model Tommy and Bulldozer. Those are the only books because I was interested. <laughs> right. And right. so then I go off to college and, and it was really a struggle because I go to my counselor, D. Kent, and she said, what are you going to do? Um, when you leave, when you leave uh, uh, high school, when you graduate, and and I yeah. had a I had a four point two, so I had A pluses in the other high school, and I had and all these in Sequoia and Sequoia and, and all these yeah. boathead yeah. classes at at Woodside. You know, I had <laughs> I had an A because I never missed a day of school in in four years. And so, and it was all graded on, uh, on attendance, nothing to do with what your, you know, how you could diagram a sentence or anything like that or history or anything uh, like that. So going off so that, so when, when, uh, D Kent said, well, what are you going to do? And she knew that, uh, I'd been accepted in a tool and dime. In fact, it's the first, uh, apprenticeship program at BYU or, or at, uh, Hewlett Packard that dealt with a uh, tool and die maker, everything else was machinist. And so, and they took everybody, I mean, they would take about anybody out of our, our, our pre-apprenticeship machine shop classes. Mm. So I said, no, I'm not going to go to Hewlett Packard. She said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to Brigham Young University. And her comment was, they won't let you in Brigham Young University. And I said, well, Ken Woolley said they would. Now, he was the valedictorian <laughs> of the class, and he was going to be my roommate. And he's also, by the way, and he would be a good guy for you to interview, he was the um, – uh, he ended up going on to graduate in physics from BYU in three years, going to Stanford and graduating with an MBA and a PhD concurrent without either of his advisors knowing it. And when he, <laughs> when he got those two uh, – honors he was protested both by faculty and by students when he went through so fast in the same time he taught two days a week at cal state hayward so that's who i was that was my room wow yeah so so and by the way oh excuse me by the way he's the founder of extra space mini stories the second largest and so that was in 1976 extra space yeah Fantastic. Well, an introduction to Tom would be wonderful. But back to uh, your choice of BYU, was it uh, Tom's influence then that led you to going there? Well, it was, yeah, Ken's influence in, uh, Ken. led me to go to BYU. And, and of course, um, and, and so, and what happened, I mean, there's only two, I really wanted to be an engineer, a manufacturing engineer, and there are only two schools on the planet that taught such a thing. And one was MIT, and no chance of getting an MIT, and the other was <laughs> BYU. And so, so, so what? The, going back to uh, D. Kent, the counselor. So, what are you going to do? And I said, Well, I'm going to go to Brigham Young University. They won't let you in Brigham Young University. And I said, uh, Well, Ken Woolley said they would. And she and she said, Well, what are you going to study? And I said, I'm going to study engineering. She said, You can't buy, be an engineer. You failed math. She was my <laughs> math teacher as a sophomore. And I said. I didn't fail. I got a D minus. <laughs> That's didn't, right. He didn't realize that two days a week at, at Sequoia that I was studying trigonometry and I love trig. And so I, and my dad would help me with that. And 
So anyhow, so I, I she thought I was going to go to CSM, which is right. College of San Mateo, which uh, yeah. we called it College of Small Minds. And I, <laughs> I thought I'd even be lucky to get in there. But I don't know. Somehow I got in BYU. And then I really struggled. Um, you know, with all the undergraduate uh, class. Well, you had to take all the general education, right? Oh, it so was horrible. Yeah. yeah, all the stuff that I that I hated in high school. So right. after three semesters, I had a 1.7 GPA. So not a good thing. And I was Ouch. I was 50 <laughs> on the lottery list to get uh, drafted to go to Vietnam. So I was not yeah. quite ready for that. And so what do I do? And my friends are going to be missionaries for the Mormon church, for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. So they had Ken had taken off and Dick Galbraith, another guy who got his PhD from Northwestern later, was my roommate the second year. And so I thought, oh boy, I got it. So I decided I got religion real fast and I became a missionary for two years. So I, did you grow up in the church? No. Uh, did you grow up in the church? You did not. Okay. No, good. I, was- I, my dad was a, a Methodist. My mom, um, she had been uh, associated. She was a member of the, of the LDS church, but I had no right. interest because my mom was more of a dictator. And when when she was at church, um, as I snuck my motorcycle out at 15 and a half and <laughs> pushed it up the street and fired it uh, up and rode it across the Dumbarton Bridge, the Fremont Drag Strip. And uh, I got there and they said, are you 18? And I said, no, but just call my dad. He'll give permission for me to race. They called and my mother answered the phone, getting ready for church. Oh, no. He's what? He's across the bay at Fremont and he wants to drag race his motorcycle. So anyhow, un- I- unbelievably so, she allowed me to race my motorcycle, went home with a trophy. And from then on, I was the record holder after that. So anyhow, <laughs> but no. So back to the uh, the religion. So you went on a mission. Where did you where did you take your mission? So I went to Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, oh, Arkansas, wow. a little bit of Texas, and for two years, and that's where I gained a little bit of leadership, and right. uh, as a leader that. in the in the church and yeah. uh, in the mission. And so um, I came back, and I was successful in school. Wow! So so did you? Um... Tell us tell us about those two years. I mean, it, you know, obviously I'm familiar with uh, the Mormon faith and, and the missions. I've got several friends who have gone all over the world, and uh, I guess they do quite a few missions in the U.S. as well. Uh, sure. Were you, um, you know, doing the knocking on the doors and sharing the faith? Was that, you know, kind of part of your uh, your mission while you were down in Louisiana? Yes. Yeah, it was the yeah. it's called the Gulf States Mission, right. and the mission home was in Shreveport, Louisiana. And so you have a mission president, and he actually was from your part of the world and uh, president of a, of a bug company. I think they had um, trucks that would drive around with big bugs up on the cabs, <laughs> and they were, uh, um, uh, anyhow, exterminator company or something. Yeah, but that was yeah. Lyman P. Pinkston, and so he was the president, for, and the mission presidents are called for, uh, for three years. And so he was the president, and then basically you've got 200 missionaries working two by two, knocking on doors and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people in that area. So it was a great opportunity to be a district leader and, and, you know, travel throughout that area. And everybody drove because it was a huge area. Now, in fact, my grandson, we, by the way, have 45 grandchildren (laughs) and just had our first, that's including our first great grandchild we just had. But anyhow, my, my grandson uh, just returned from what's now called the Baton Rouge mission. And I was there for seven months in Baton Rouge, but he returned from that mission after two years, just recently, six months ago. So, so you mentioned when you came back to school, you did better. What, what did you pick up? What was it that you learned during your mission period and that you applied or were able to apply when you went back to BYU? Well, I learned how to read. Yeah. Pretty simple. So that, that was, <laughs> yeah. So you know you're you're, and that, you're sorry. You're constantly you're constantly reading the scriptures. So you've got right. you know the old and new testament, which you know I know backwards and forward, and uh, and then uh, of course the Book of Mormon, which is God's dealings with His people here in the Americas, a second witness right. to Jesus Christ. And so familiar yeah. with that from 600 BC to 421 AD. And how that relates to the Bible, same kind of people from the same part of the world. And so 
but I got very familiar with those scriptures. And, and yeah. it was quite interesting because I couldn't read very well at first. And you're in front of people and you're reading, you know, prophecies of the of the of the coming of the Savior to the to the world and, and also visitation to here in the Americas. And so uh, in one incident, I had so I had to memorize everything. So I memorized wow. 138. Ah, sorry, 138 different scriptures. And so, and also passages, pages. And so when I would read to people, you know, we'd go teach people uh, certain discussions. And once I was caught with a, with the scriptures upside down and, and I'm just <laughs> like, I'm reading out of them. And the lady said, is there, <laughs> is there something wrong with your book? It's why is it upside down? And I said, oh, well, oh, I, and I have to classic. tell a story, you know? <laughs> so, and I just, you know, I had to learn a lot of things. In fact, I was just, we're just studying the, the old Testament right now in Joseph. And it reminded me of when a lady said, you know, the, the, uh, the new Testament, um, is the re- or the the Bible is a record of the descendants of um, um, of Israel and uh, the two different books and then the other the 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 Book of Mormon is a record of the descendants of Joseph and the lady said well which Joseph is that and I said oh that's the Joseph with the coat of many feathers <laughs> that's right <laughs> and, the amazing instead of, yeah, instead of, <laughs> instead of uh, many colors I the think. Joseph that went to Egypt not the one that lived in New York right right. right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so it sounds like you embraced the Mormon religion then, uh, oh, yes. coming back and, yeah. and have continued to uh, operate. And that's great. It, has faith been a pretty big part of your business success? It has. I mean, you realize yeah. that it's, you know, it's 99%. Um, it's it's 1% inspiration and it's 99% perspiration. <laughs> and so, right. you know, I feel highly inspired in everything that I do. Yeah, so, fantastic. I mean, there's no, you know that the veil is very thin and that, that God is is in our everyday work. He knows us well. He knows what we're trying to do, and He's very supportive in the things that I've invented. No question. So, did you work then um, after coming back from mission? I assume that the draft uh, time was averted. You came back and finished up your engineering degree. Uh, were you fully committed to your studies? Was there jobs that you had during your call at those last couple of college years? Yeah, I worked. I worked in a machine shop uh, as a uh, an instructor at, at BYU. So I worked for BYU. I also worked, I bought and sold cars very successfully. And in fact, mm. and started a import business. Uh, my friend, Ken uh, Woolley, the one that's uh, the founder of Extra Space, he right. he served a mission in England. And so he ended up, um, he ended up uh, going back many times and, and, uh, um, and, and does business, of course, all over the world. In fact, he just, well, I won't get into that, but, um, so we were importing cars. So we we're yeah. bringing in, uh, mini Coopers. In fact, I still have a Lotus Elite, a 1963 Lotus <laughs> Elite. There's only a thousand thirty of them made and they won Le Mans, uh, five years in a row. And I was, uh, we were able to bring that over, which I still have today. In fact, I almost gave it to Jay Leno. I was on the yeah. Jay Leno show, you know, 10 years ago, uh, right. immediately, you know, when we became a success with Will It Blend, I was on Jay Leno and then the Today Show the next week and Katie Couric and Charles Osgood and Donnie Deutsch. And so it's been, you know, one show after another, but I was there with, with Jay. And first of all, we're talking about uh, water jet printers. I said, yeah, BYU, we built one that had, it was, it was 24,000. Uh, PSI, and he says, "Oh, I've got one. It's forty-two thousand PSI." G. So, so Jay and I hit it off really well. He knew my Lotus well, and I almost gave it to him. And I, my wife said, "No, you need to restore it." So in nine months, we restored the Lotus Elite. It's one of the nicest ones on the planet, and I've raced it, and so that's a whole nother. But so Good yeah, fun. so I so I imported. Cars. So you were you were doing the, you're doing the exporting cars while you were going to school. Yes. So as a BYU, we're importing wow. Rolls's ro- older Rolls Royces <laughs> and and uh, old Jags, 1938 Jags, MGTDs, TCs, TFs, um, and so on from England, and for three years until you know the late seventies, and then uh, I mean the late sixties. And so then everybody started doing it and, and that wasn't right. such a good deal. But yeah, so that's how I made a lot of money 
doing that. And then also, unfortunately, I married my income property too. It was only $100 a week, but I married <laughs> a, a wonderful woman who uh, was a nurse. So she also uh-huh. worked and we had our first two children uh, there in Utah before 19, seven, January of 71 when I left. So yes, I had to, I paid for my own mission. I paid for my own education at BYU. And I paid for, you know, living expenses as I went through, you know, college and so on. So that's awesome. Well, tell, tell us about your early years. So you got your degree, uh, were married, had a couple of kids, it sounded like soon thereafter or at that same time. Yeah. What, what were some of the first jobs you had and kind of led you on your way? Well, I went to, first of all, I had the, you know, with no more deferment after a, after a, a student deferment, a ministerial surf, deferment, and then another student deferment, it was time to join the National Guard. Oh, you were still eligible for the draft. Oh, sure. Even after all those deferments. Oh, wow. sure. Number 50. And so, yeah. and uh, they're calling them up like crazy. And so, uh, of course, Ken was at Stanford getting his PhD and MBA there. And so he went to a draft counselor and they said, man, this guy, and told him what my circumstances were. They said, this guy better better do something or he's going to end up in Vietnam, you know, in the front lines. And so uh, his wife, Athelia, she, so she went to, uh, she lo- she started looking around in the Bay Area because I, uh, you know, I, I really, I didn't know where I was going. I had job opportunity in, in Southern California as well as as well as uh, in in Washington State Tri Cities okay. area, mm-hmm. but she uh, she she looked at different National Guard units and found right near the San Francisco Airport in San Bruno, the twenty six thirty second transportation unit, which was uh, she says, oh Tom likes trucks, let's sign him <laughs> up for that. So anyhow, she signed me up, and so which made it a little difficult to get a job, knowing that I had to go active duty at some point un- unknown, you know, in the next year, and so. Anyhow, so I left. I had to be in the Bay Area, so I left BYU with a wife and two children, a little trailer full of all of our possessions, and moved to uh, Cupertino, of all places. Oh, right. And, and in a short order, um, bought a house for uh, $27,000, which is <laughs> fun to see what that house is worth, because that's where they just put the new facility the new the apple, new apple building yeah that's right that's right <laughs> so well i imagine house, it was still pretty underdeveloped at that time too right yeah, it's true yeah and so that just house, yeah yeah so that house that we sold uh, three years later for forty seven thousand. now it's worth i think almost <laughs> three million Probably. and then the, the other house we bought for fifty thousand is now worth close to the same right near the same campus oh, for your real estate yeah but anyhow so what i did is um I, I handed the, a headhunter. There's a there's a new company starting out, and so I, I met with a headhunter and handed her my resume. And the resume, and this is to go to work for a pharmaceutical company. And so I hand her the resume, and she reads through it and says, "Yeah, interesting." And then she gets to the bottom where it said that I was a missionary, and this was mm-hmm. not a good thing. Mm-hmm. Nor was it a good thing that I had two children because this is going to work for the inventor of the birth control pill. Uh, and and so they're not into kids and they're not into <laughs> and, say the you least. Know, and these, yeah and these are some of the top scientists in the world these are husband wife um husband wife uh, research people no children and these are well, I mean wonderful people but they just chose to you know a career over families and so and the and the the program then was to have no um i mean the two Two live births is all that was covered under the insurance program and unlimited abortions. Ooh. So, uh, yeah, so it was kind of tough. But I changed. I, was, I did go to work there and, uh, and I was able to change those to unlimited live births and, um, and limiting abortions to two. So I was part of the corporate communications committee nice. when we had one. But I was the 24th employee there. Wow. And so um, it was a great I was the first hands on guy, the first guy to make anything. And so I made the first patch just months after I left uh, BYU. And so that's the scopolamine motion sickness patch. Okay. And so that uh, patch, and we did all the testing on that. We set up a slalom course in the backyard of, of uh, Alza. And that's named after Alejandro Zaffaroni, um, the first two letters of his two names, a very famous uh, South American doctor. Uh who passed away just a couple of years ago. 
And that was the most active trading stock in the San Francisco Bay Area for 10 years. It was unbelievable for a company that wasn't making any profit um, initially, but it was really had a a great story. And so um, the next thing that we worked on was the was taking a day and a half's worth of oral hormone in the form of a birth control pill, but putting it in the uterus as an IUD. And so that day and a half's worth of progesterone uh, would last for two years as an as an interuterine device. Right. So the first our, and our first name for that was the uterine progesterone system. And uh, those guys that drive around in those brown trucks didn't like the acronym <laughs> <laughs> UPS. Yes, right. And so <laughs> so we changed the name to Progestacert. And in the late and that was in the early seventies. Uh, in the late seventies. The IUD, the the Copper Seven, Dalcon Shield, uh, Tatum T, all of them were taken off the market. The only one for the really the last forty years that's been on the market is the Progestacert. Right. Still on the market today, but now there's a Marine and some others that have even longer delivery life. So there was that, and then also the Oculusert, the ocular uh, system where for glaucoma patients, where we put a small amount of pilocarpine algenic acid into a uh, elliptical shape, like a soft contact that you'd put under your lower eyelid. And instead of putting drops in your eye every every few hours and not being able to see for an hour and swallowing 80% of what you put in your eye, we developed this device which would release pilocarpine algenic acid over the course of mm-hmm. the week. And so you put it in Sunday night and you get 20 micrograms per hour release uh, over the week or 40 if it's a P40 a micrograms per hour. And so it was a, a the whole concept of the company was a control release of drug through permeable plastic membranes. All right. All so right. that, that was the beginning. Well, of how that, long, how long like. did you stay with Alsa? Four and a half years. Four and a half years. And did you have yeah. some management responsibility there or were you just pretty much in the development of new products? Uh, you know, give us an overview of your responsibilities at the time of your departure. Yeah, I, I, um, I was over engineering uh-huh. And I had about 30 engineers and uh, technicians that worked for me. And and I was a terrible manager. <laughs> <laughs> you knew what question was coming, Tom. <laughs> so that was your first management experience, and it sounds like, right? Yeah, yeah, other than, you know, in the in the mission field as a missionary. Yeah. And so it was, right. yeah, it was tough. And, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, my boss, and we grew, you know, that in that four and a half years, we grew to uh, 650 employees, and wow. you know, and we grew to 12 buildings in the Stanford Industrial Park. So I was in the first building, and anyhow, that was a growth. So I had 12 off. No, I had 14 offices. Uh, you know, over that period of four and a half years, that's how the company grew. Incredible. And uh, of course, you know, later. Um, we sold a lot of technology to J and J, and you know Nicoderm and some of the other things. But right. anyhow, but getting back to that, so I had these. I slowly, I had no excuse for not performing because we had a hundred million dollars of Chase Manhattan money, and wow. I could spend anything I wanted. I had this is in the, you know the early seventies. That's a lot yeah, of money. That's a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and so here. I had, I had, I didn't have to do any, I had accountants working for me. I had all of the um, HR people, you know, hire anybody I needed. I could build, and if I'm trying to do a project fast, I would have five companies quote on the same thing. I'd have three companies build it, and then I'd trash two of them, um, you know, or whatever. I mean, just it, it, time was of the essence. I had yeah. absolutely no excuse for not performing. And so... But I had a tough time. But what I, what I was going to say is my first, um, I, I got my first review and re- when they started reviewing people and you got one out of 10. And, you know, technically I'm, you know, eight to 10. And then then uh, but management wise, I was down in the bottom of the pile. And wow. I and I asked my I asked my manager, I said, this what does this mean diplomacy i had no idea <laughs> and it's like i'm like one right? <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm like one or two you know on diplomacy or minus two or whatever i said what does this mean what does diplomacy oh, mean i really love didn't it. i love so, it so anyhow so i had to learn how to and i had to learn and this is where you know i learned from my dad because he was a wonderful dad and 
he taught, I mean, he was very patient with me. He would come home from HP every day with scrap material that he bought out of the scrap pile. And I'd, I'd sit and he'd sit by me in the lathe room and with his can of beer and, and just counseling me. And, and, uh, Tell us a little more about that influence. You, you mentioned a, a little bit about your mother and uh, obviously her involvement. And, you know, wh- how did your parents influence your, your, your style, your, you know, your approach to life? Yeah, well, I say, would, would say that my dad, because of the lack of, of interest in, in really supervising people, but he was just a great inventor and, and mm-hmm. very entrepreneurial. And the Hewlett Packard was constantly in Watts Current, which was a Hewlett Packard magazine in the early days. But he uh, he was just patient, and he, he you know he taught me about metalworking and learned how to weld. And as I was in San Francisco, even as a soldering, I learned how to solder before I was five, and I was welding when I was six or seven. And so, um, wow. and so he just taught me, you know. Sorry, he just he taught me how things worked. Yeah, you know yeah. How, how things are made. He he was an amateur photographer, so I he actually has I have color uh, movies of the World's Fair in 1938. So he was in the into all sorts Fabulous. of photography. So I learned that and just a lot of other skills. My mother on the, how many years? How many years was he at HP? He was there um, from from uh, 51 until he passed away in 64. So oh, wow. yeah, he so was 56 when he passed away. And so my parents, oh, so yeah. yeah. And, but my mother, uh, on the other hand, she was, fi- she was also entrepreneurial and she, she was an inventor. She actually had a patent oh. and so on, but she, um, so she, she worked when my dad was in Tinian and, uh, during world war two, and he made the still out of uh, the, the stills out of airplane parts and uh, so he provided the liquor for the for the officers and so on on Tinian, and then he was uh, uh, also made the manglers and the thing to to press the clothes for the officers and so on. And uh, then he, you know, with with airplane parts, and then he was actually um, involved uh, with the uh, Enola Gay and was was actually flying alongside really? that for the. Uh, for the bombing over Hiroshima, famous bombing. Yeah, wow. and so uh, which which really bothered me when I went with the founder of of Costco, um, uh, Jim Sidigal and Craig uh, Jelinek, the CEO uh, now. And as I'm as I go to uh, uh, that part of uh, Japan, and I yeah. think, oh no, what am I going to do? And the night before, I'm surfing the channel, and I see that that the Japanese guy is talking about what a blessing it was that we dropped the bomb oh. over Hiroshima because, um, you know, otherwise, instead of a, a half a million people being killed in the war, there would have been, you know, millions of people killed. So I thought, OK, yeah. that's interesting. And so I didn't <laughs> feel so bad. My dad never talked about that. But anyhow, so yeah. that's my dad. So but during the war, yeah. my mother was in the San Francisco shipyards. Oh. And. She was supervising 30 journeyman uh, electricians. And making boats. Making, make, ships. making battleships and pulling wow. miles of wire. She could read blueprints. Um, obviously not dyslexic. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and so she was she was uh, wiring up ships. And so she as a as a single as a as a as a one person. You know, a woman running all of those journeyman electrician, you know, managing those folks. So she was a better manager, certainly, than my dad. But she uh, later, when my dad passed away and the kids are grown, then she worked at Hewlett Packard, worked for Dave and Bill, were putting all of the prototype circuit boards together. So she ran, she did manage all of those women that would stuff those boards and solder the boards and do all the testing of the boards. Uh, at Hewlett Packard in in uh, in the middle um, '60s, uh, after my dad passed away, so yeah. that's what she did, and so she knew that's how to. It. So I got some. I did learn some things from her, and <laughs> and the women loved her, even though she was a real dictator as a mother. <laughs> and uh, I mean, she did wear the pants in the family. My dad was laid back and and just a great guy, but yeah. and so was she as a more of a leadership, and so she was involved with you know, the uh, different things going on in the community. And she was a real activist when it came to that. So she was truly a Rosie Riveter 
and that uh, great woman. But that so that helped, you know, I, me manage a little Fantastic. bit. And, and was Harvard House and Food and Grains next in your career? Is that where you went after all? So tell us a little bit about your transition to that position. Yeah, what I did is during while I was still at Alza, I started to uh, people were storing grains, uh, wheat in uh, in in the San Francisco Bay Area and and uh, they're putting they're putting wheat in plastic buckets. And with my understanding of the permeation of drug through plastic membranes, I knew that was not a good thing because moisture and gases go right through that that polyethylene and right, and they right. get the moisture into the grains and then weevil comes alive and it's not a good way. And so people, that's how people were storing. So I came up with some new storage techniques and I ordered uh, 48,000 pounds of wheat uh, from, um, <laughs> from Colorado. And hmm. so that was coming in. I developed a, uh, a wheat packing device that would package that 48,000 pounds of wheat in about six hours. So I developed that machine in my garage and then in, uh, in uh, uh, Santa Clara, I leased a, a small building on Walsh Avenue and then while I was still at, at Alza. And so I brought that in on a, on a Saturday and we were able to, uh, so started that company uh, first called the uh, Survival Life and then Harvest House Food and Supply. And so we we're packaging, you know, <laughs> tens of thousands of pounds of grain, um, you know, and so I was doing that on the side. But what okay. I'd done before I even started that company is I ran the week through my wife's vacuum cleaner, the Kirby vacuum cleaner, blew it out. <laughs> And I thought, oh, this is not good because I'm trying to maintain the integrity of the grains and not break it up. But I ran it through this vacuum cleaner and blew it out into a pillowcase, put a sample in a baby food bottle. And then every time it went through the vacuum cleaner, it got finer and finer, uh-huh. dirtier, but finer. So I had a dozen baby food bottles lined up and eventually you had fine flour out of a vacuum cleaner. Wow. So I thought, wow, if instead of having a $150 motor, you had a $10 vacuum cleaner motor. And you could do that on one pass with a vacuum cleaner motor, then you'd really have something. So that's what that's when I developed the the uh, the kitchen mill, and that yeah. was, in fact, the patent attorney Tom Ciotti, who's very famous now. Um, he was the first patent attorney at Alza, and I got so tired of these patents coming across my desk to review and sign. And but I was, and I get my two dollars. Most companies pay you a dollar when you have a patent. <laughs> they were so good that Alza paid two dollars. <laughs> but anyhow, he did my first patent on the side for a thousand dollars for that mill, which stood up in federal court and won a major, you know, case in the in ah. federal court because people are always copying my ideas. So, so what year? What year are we now? What what year was Harvest Grain? Okay, you- that would that would have been. Um, Let's see. That would have been um, seventy, about seventy-five, something like okay. that. Okay, seventy. And that's still going today. Harvest House Food yeah. and Supply is still on the internet, and so Ed and Helen Nienau bought the company from me. And uh, meanwhile, my heart was not in it because right. my heart was into making grain mills. So yeah. he was wondering. He had ordered a bunch of of stuff. He was a real estate broker. Um, um, in, in the Bay Area, and he offered to, uh, he ordered some stuff, and I didn't deliver it. And so mm-hmm. he finally came in to pick it up himself, and I said, well, why don't you just buy the whole company? And so <laughs> so he bought the company, <laughs> and, and then he didn't pay me, and then later he did. <laughs> but anyhow, so that was the first c- company, and then I started. So you developed the mill by that yeah, time. Yeah, and so then, uh, yeah, so I'm working on the mill from, from about, yeah, from, from 75 until, until 79 when we introduced the mill and we sold 43,000 mills in two years. So wow. very successful. I went to the the number one company, Magic Mill, it was making mills at the time. And I showed them, hey, you're going to be out of business. And uh, so they jumped on the bandwagon and they uh, put their name Magic Mill 2 on wow. my first mill for two years. And during the first year of that two-year contract, when the patent issued, they immediately got an engineer to circumvent the patent. And so oh. when my so when my um, contract ran out in two years, then they already they didn't quite have a mill ready. And then they sued me because the patent was in my name personally, not in the Kitchenetics name is uh-huh. the first company. So Kitchenetics made the mill with a Magic Mill 2 name on it. And so they sued me for eight hundred thousand dollars in an attempt to put me out Ooh. of business and to get the get their hands on the patent. And so then they realized the patent wasn't in in the company's name; it was yeah. still in my name, yeah. and so that caused them 
grief. So we finally won that lawsuit. And then we went from, you know, about 80 employees. And, and we had at that time another company, which nobody in the world could make the rotor and stator for that mill. So I literally, to what you're saying earlier, I machined the molds to wow. make the, the wax patterns. And we put in our own foundry in, in um, Campbell, California on Dell Avenue, So, which is not a good place to put a foundry in a Silicon <laughs> Valley where you're melting steel at, at uh, 3,000 degrees and you're using all sorts of chemicals and oh. stuff. But anyhow, uh, California is not the best place to do business. <laughs> No, no, not, not too many factories left in Silicon Valley, no. although you know, there were plenty of them way back when. Yeah, so, in fact, one of our clients just closed a plant not too long ago. But I want to go back to something just for a moment, Tom, if I will. You, we had mentioned about, you know, your struggles uh, with regards to the folks that you managed and, and learning what diplomacy meant. Yes. <laughs> How did you kind of develop that further? Because for obvious reasons, you needed help. Uh, when you were at Harvest Food and in Harvest House, and obviously as you you went to forming Blend Tech, which we'll get into in a minute, um, you had to lead people. So what happened? What what changed? You know, we talked about how the mission trip really helped you to learn how to read, and that helped you go back to school. What was it that changed, and what did you work on, and how did you kind of develop those people management, those leadership skills? Yeah, I think I learned a lot at Alza, and just even. You know, as I was a missionary, just meeting different people, you know, from all different walks of life and all different. Yeah. And so I, you know, I met some of the most fascinating people, you know, from from a, a guy who owned a chain of mortuaries in the South, you know, <laughs> and, and just, you know, his management techniques and and what how he how he would trusted people and how he he hired just the very best people. And you just want to surround yourself with people that have these talents because yeah. you've got to have marketing, you've got to have and sales, and you have to understand finance and all these things that I had no interest in. Um, right. You right. know, so you just have to really have a good feel for people and and their spirits and what their desires were and and what their 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 qualities were and and. And, you know, very. And then did you just let them go? I mean, how did you um, lead? How did you manage? Or did you just surround yourself with good people, with strong character and integrity and honesty and trustworthiness and expect them to the jobs they were hired for? Exactly. So well put. You just have yeah. to have people that you can trust and just yeah. you can let go because you have no idea in most cases what they're doing. And so I, you know, and, I, and with all of that. Or not care. Yeah. Yeah. And so people and, and so and now you would think I would learn my lesson back then, because more recently we've had some problems with some people I hired that weren't so good. And that's what's mm -hmm. caused us some lot of, a lot of grief more recently. I finally hired uh, and we can talk about that later, but fire, finally hired uh, two CEOs within a short period of time. The first one lasted eight months. The, the second one ended up bringing his own um, his own controller in. And uh, and that was a disaster because they conspired together to embezzle from us. And oh, just two goodness. weeks ago, one got indicted on eleven counts of of, of um, you know felony. And so mm. um, yeah, and so that's the kind of thing that you know I, I you think I would have learned my lesson, but those are people that were not honest and did take me down the and then along with the next group that that one of them went, went for the one that's just got you know got arrested. And uh, we'll be going to jail. And so, you know, those and he went to work for someone else. And and when they, mm. and I said, when I found out they hired him, I said, you can't, you know, why would you do that? And I said, well, we'll watch him carefully. And he lasted <laughs> 18 months there. And then when they fired him and, of course, they kept the computers, which were ours, which had all, all of their their financial, all of their their payroll and stuff on the computers. He said, "No, those are my computers." <laughs> and I already oh told goodness. them no that they stole the when when we when I fired them, they spent seventeen thousand dollars at Apple buying com buying computers on our credit cards after I oh. fired them. Well, they did the same thing there, but they they he wrote a check for for four hundred thousand dollars and and deposited in the bank, and then another bank, and then he went in four days later. This is after this next company fired him. And then they got him uh, at Zion's Bank on camera where they said, I'm sorry, 
um, Sean Reyes, the attorney general, has seized your this account. And so they have a picture of him in the bank uh. with the look on his face. But anyhow, uh. those are the kind of people that you hire that you, you know, that's where I, you know, occasionally you're going to make a mistake. I've hired some bad people in the thousands of people that have worked for me and up to 500 more recently. Um, you know, we just now know, especially with lean manufacturing and, and not only manufacturing, but in, in we do lean uh, principles even in our marketing Good. and our accounting and everything else. So that's something that's been very helpful to having the best people and knowing when they kind of weed themselves out when they can't live up to the, you know, to the standards of, of lean. Right. And right. so yeah, that's, that's been helpful. Very helpful. You, now you now see the disadvantage of in of, of being ADHD. You remember where we started <laughs> and where we are now? And now we're finally at Plentech. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 50 minutes late. So tell us, you know, the foundations obviously came out of Magic Mill, but uh, where are we? 1978, 1980? When, when did you f- found the company? Okay. Then in, in uh, yeah, so really Kitchen Addicts was founded in, in in seven about seventy seven something like that seventy seven right. and uh, and that's when and I, you know I started out just hiring some some good people and then and then um, it, it's just been tough you know finding uh, yeah. the right kind of people and doing the right thing and you have your ups and downs that almost killed us being sued by Magic Mill because they took off and they were making their own mill and so I had to go back in nineteen. Um, 1981, when they started making their own mill, and uh, I had to, we're still in California, and and they had a lot of operations in Utah. So what I did is I mustered up enough money to to while well, we moved, uh, you know, uh, to a more favorable place to manufacture, and that's Utah. And there's no better place that I've seen in the world because you have the smartest people here in Utah. You know, the most college graduates and the most, even though they're not going to be with you forever because they're very entrepreneurial. But while they're with you, um, boy, do you get the production and the and the and the brains out of them. So um, they're very uh, it was just a great place to move. So um, we moved here a little over 30 years ago. And then um, I put in stores, set up manufacturing, just bootstrapping, starting all over again. And and. and then um, I put in a seven stores within a half a mile of Magic Mill's most successful mm-hmm. stores. And at that time, I'm importing a German mixer from Dachau. And so the Germans make the best appliances, made the best appliances at the time, Bosch being one of them, and, and they make bottom drive mixers. So I imported one, modified it um, in Campbell, and actually started this in, in California. And then... And then moved to uh, moved it to Utah, where we developed our own mixer. But anyhow, at, at the same time I'm developing a mixer, we're do, having these retail stores. Six months after we moved to Utah and set up these stores, uh, Magic Mill filed for bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. So that was the end of Magic Mill. And so we won that battle. And we had a store in Las Vegas, and we had multiple stores in Utah because this is the bread baking capital of the world. Right. More, it, right. And so. Then we jumped into, of course, a bad timing because that's when everybody decides that carbs are not good and people stop making <laughs> bread. That's right. They're but, right. <laughs> but fortunately, and this is from an experience I had in 1968 at a, a wedding present I did get from Ken Woolley, which was a rival blender, which didn't last very long. I mean, wow. it kept breaking. And so I thought someday I'm going to make a blender that won't break. And so here we are. Um, in in Utah, developing a mixer with a blender that won't break, and so ah. and, a, and, and we can make. We're a kitchen aid. We'll make three pounds of bread dough. You know, we're making twelve pounds of bread dough in the in a smaller bowl. So and sensing the gluten development in the dough and shutting it off when the the dough is perfectly needed. And so that's an, another invention that that uh, nobody else had. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, but what happened with this mixer, people stopped making bread and then, but they started using our mixer, the blender on the mixer commercially. Right. Nobody had a real true commercial blender. So, and this is when the smoothie shops are popping up. And so I said, okay, you want to make a blender that won't break? And so that led to the development <laughs> of 
the best blenders in the world. And then immediately, of course, we're in Starbucks. We're in 64 countries with, in Starbucks. We're also uh, in Jamba Juice and Zuka Juice yeah. and all the major. Um, and we're in all the scoop shops, Baskin Robbins, Hagen dazs Ben & Jerry's. Anybody that's in the ice cream business, they better be using our blender at that time or they can't compete. Right. And so then you have constantly, you've got Vitamix, our main competitor, and they're coming along and they don't really have a decent machine. But the first thing they did, they couldn't compete. And so 12 years ago, when I invented the, the uh, Memorial Day weekend in uh, three, uh, two days on, on a Friday afternoon and a Saturday and a Monday, I developed the wild side jar. That's the one you'll see in Jamba today. And I just took a bunch of our four-sided jar, two-quart jars, cut them all up, glued them together in a shop. And when the engineers came in on Tuesday and, and made smoothies in that thing, you know, nothing to this day has outperformed wow. it. So Vitamix could not compete because they got a plunger that they're cramming stuff down in a crisscross blade yeah. with. And we have a single blade with winglets. And so and a dull blade and a thick blade that doesn't break. It's taken me 17 years to develop a, a blade that won't break. And now you've got our competitor, Vitamix, who just recalled 170,000 blenders because according to the U.S. Consumer Protection Agency, the uh, blades can break off, cause serious laceration and even mm -hmm. death. Because people, and this goes back to in your part of the world, in Santa Ana, where a gal gul gulped her cappuccino oh. blast in a, in a Baskin Robbins store and swallowed the end of a blade and had to have oh, it surgically oh. removed. Now that happened to be a Hamilton Beach blade, and of course she sued. Um, she sued Baskin Robbins. They sued Hamilton Beach, and other things had broken off in in other spindle blenders. And uh, anyhow, so that's so I I was bound. So so your business your business was was significantly large commercially before you got into the consumer side. It's true, absolutely. Yeah. So. You know, where were you and, you know, relative dollar value, if you don't mind sharing on the commercial side before you got into Will It Blend and, and the consumer market? Well, what was fun is you've got, you know, we're already starting with Howard Schultz, you know, and uh, and we're in we're in Barnes and Noble bookstores because uh, we made the first quiet blender with a sound enclosure. And the only one ah. see when you have when you have enough horsepower to dra drive a single blade that's not a crisscross blade that's thick and dull. It takes more horsepower, but it does the job faster. And so we're using a motor, a vacuum cleaner motor, and that's uh, that's made by Amatech. And so that motor is three peak horsepower. And so then mm. we also had some that were three point eight peak horsepower. Now now you've got the, all these juice uh, shops that are starting up. So Jamba in San Luis Obispo, and they were they were uh, um, anyhow not called Jamba then. They were, they were Juice Club when it started. And so they called us down there and said, hey, they're looking at all these different blenders. And they had everybody's blenders that they got from wherever they could find them. And then they invited us down. We go in and demonstrate our blender. And, and after they said, we got to have this. And they took all the other blenders in San Luis Obispo. They threw them, in there, they threw them <laughs> up against a, a brick wall and they smashed them all. And they said, okay, we're, this is after we kind of had an agreement. And they said, look. Um, you know, Howard Schultz sits on our board and every time they put in a Starbucks, they're going to put in a Jamba. And I thought, I don't think that's going to happen. But, <laughs> but anyhow, and I looked at all their cards are like t 12 employees and they're all vice presidents. So they're really <laughs> planning on a real growth. So what they did is they said, look, we like exclusivity on your blender. And I said, mm. well, you know, that's kind of a problem because we have other people in smoothie shops and so on and all over the world. And so. But um, you can't have exclusivity, um, but we'd be glad to sell you blenders. And by the way, we don't have any money. And so I said, don't worry. I'll give you a half a dozen blenders in every store and 40 jars. And they only had 11 stores at the time. And just give me a nickel every time you do a blend. Yeah. And so, so after they got up to 50 million blends a year, which was $1.5 million for us, uh, we had low, well, we had lowered our from five cents, lowered it to three cents. So we we're uh, making about 1.5 million yeah. a year on Jamba. But then Vitamix went to them and said, "Look, um, we will uh, we'll do, do all your blends for two cents a cycle mm. and save you, you know, half a million dollars a year." And they were trying to go public and they didn't have any money and all this other stuff. And so they um, 
So they said, okay, and they were just rolling out our wild side jar. So they said, okay, if you'll give us a jar, that'll perform as well as a wild side jar. So we can just do one blend. We don't have to do two or three blends and cavitate and all that other stuff. And they said, no problem. Uh, we'll give you a jar that's comparable to the wild side jar. So they copy that jar mm. to every detail. Everything's the same. A uh, nesting jar, I have two patents with 51 claims. And it, and they they violated every part of every. Mm. <laughs> and so we thought, okay, but that got them into Jamba. And then Jamba had the ethics to not use that wild side jar. Yeah. And so they uh, they were wonderful people, and they're still you know I still know some of them today that that didn't copy us, but they were stuck with this horrible jar that I see I have a patent on nesting jars, so they didn't nobody had a jar that would nest in another jar, and if you have forty jars in a smoothie shop or a coffee shop that don't nest, where are you going to put them? And so they had to modify a jar that they already had that was horrible with a crisscross blade. So they have had to change all our recipes. They have to do two or three blends to, to affect the good blend. And so they were stuck. Jamba was stuck in a six-year contract, which they thought was a three-year contract. Mm. But anyhow, so they ended up, you know, then they, and they had 326 stores when they were doing 50 million smoothies at a time. I'm, I mean, a, a year. And uh, they had that many 360 stores doing 50 million, and then they grew to 860 stores, and uh, and then uh, but they were stuck in that contract with that bad blender, and so finally we we sued them for using our jar, and and the federal court judge and jury found them guilty of willful patent infringement, and awarded us 24.1 million dollars, wow. and so. And, uh, you know, it took a while. It took two and a half years to get the money. It took us, you know, we we're involved in the litigation for six oh, and a half years. So and, but that's what, you know, but they were doing 700 million or, yeah, 700 million in sales, according to to uh, Vitamix. That was yeah. their sales. And we're down at the you know, 130 some odd million. And uh, but anyhow, so we. So tell, tell us about, back to the question, how did you kind of transition from a commercial provider to the Starbucks and the Jamba Juices of the world to getting into the consumer market? Well, because we had the, the you know, consumers were starting to use our blenders. I mean, they could see the, the value of them. We did have mm -hmm. one designed that was actually designed in uh, when I was still, um, still in California. And in fact, that's our most popular one today. And uh, that's the total blender. It's, it's, 30, it's 30 years old and, uh, and using that vacuum cleaner motor. And so we started uh, um, just very poor in, a, in advertising, um, but started moving it out. And then it was really uh, later on when we uh, when people well, people discovered this is the most powerful blender right. available and right. word of mouth, you know, got it out there. But what really did it is when I hired a marketing guy, George Wright, and we had no marketing. I mean, we're really just, you know, mainly commercial, but um, right. he came along and, and he, he said, what's this pile of sawdust on the floor? And, and somebody <laughs> says, oh, that's Tom just trying to break blenders and blades and, and shafts and bearing, you know, whatever. And so he said, he came to me and said, what's my budget? And I said, you're the budget, you're expensive. <laughs> and he said, well, how, how about... How about fifty dollars? And I said, Yeah, you can have fifty dollars. And so he went out and he went to Costco and he bought a rotisserie chicken and he bought some marbles and rake handles and and uh, other things like that. And and uh, um, what blend was and, born? And he came back and he <laughs> and he said, Hey, blend these things. I'm going to video. You know, we're going to oh video you blending them. So then he came to me five days later and he said, Man, we hit a home run. We have we have six million views on YouTube. Oh and my I, goodness! And That's I said, great. And I said, "Hootube." I had no idea what YouTube was. I mean, that was the early days, you know. I love and it. So I love it. How many years ago was that, Tom? When when did uh, that campaign would get born for fifty bucks? That was eleven years ago. Eleven years ago. And wow. So within a yeah, week, you know, we get a call from Jay Leno's group, and they said, "Hey, yeah. can you come out here and we'll fly you out, <laughs> bring, bring the family?" And you know, so we did that. And then the next week, the this is right the, the day before Thanksgiving. I'm out on the out out in the plaza with the with the Today Show blending uh, 
uh, six different things. And, and so anyhow, that was kind of the beginning. And so um, now, now I've had uh, 500 million views on the internet and uh-huh. we have almost 900,000 uh, subscribers. And so, that you is. know, we're just having a great time, but our sales went up a thousand percent right out of the shoot. Oh, I can imagine. So people I can probably, imagine that you, you probably had some manufacturing challenges, right? Uh, when they got that demand. We really did. And we're so, yeah. we're so inclined. I mean, we were making things in China, you know, uh, blender blades in China and, and other parts and the motors are made in Mexico because they don't make them in the U S anymore. Amatech, the best manufacturer. And so, we um, uh, we really yeah we struggled, but we continue to do more and more things in house. We're the, really the only American made kitchen countertop appliance awesome. when you look at what yeah. we do. And so now we just brought in another ten million dollars worth of automation, so we can take copper out of the largest man made hole on the planet, which happens to be here in Utah, or out of Arizona or other places here, but good old American soil, and. Uh, and 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 make ingots of, of copper out of that, ship it to the Midwest, and draw that copper into wire. And so wow. we uh, we wind our own motors. We we can wind a motor. We have two winders. We wind in eight seconds each. So in in that short period of time, I mean, every eight seconds we can produce a finished motor of our design, um, made you know right here in America, and then we can drop that into a uh, build a blender. Same thing. Everything's set on an eight-second timeline, so we can build a blender every eight seconds. And so wow. we do all of our own uh, metal parts. So we have fourteen Sugami uh, electric uh, uh, CNC machines. We have fifteen injection molding machines up to five hundred tons, where we can mold all of our own plastic parts. So when you see the enclosures that are in Jamba Juice and other places around the world, uh, in 92 countries, you'll see our sound enclosures molded right here and in our own factory. Fabulous. We make 17 of our own circuit boards uh, with everything we possibly can use, you know, at, from the U.S. And so that's what we do right here in, in Orem, Utah. Well, you know, we're about five minutes past the hour. I do have a couple of wrap up questions I'd like to ask of you if you have the time for us. Can we go for sure. a few more minutes? Oh, yeah. No limit. Fantastic. So, you know, you've obviously had to build quite an organization. Uh, how many people are in Blendtec today? Well, we've been, as, we've, we've been as high as 500. And now, now we're in the mid 300s. But uh, we get as we get, you know, we train people who really would be rep, would just be doing routine um uh, maneuvers. I mean, just assembly, routine things. And we've now they're programming CNC machines and robots just to put our motors together. We have 16 robots, yeah. and there's robots on all of our on our other machines. So we've been able to train these people, and that really stand out through this lean manufacturing process. And we train them to do things that aren't so routine. And so we're down to you know the mid 300s, and. Uh, and, and producing, uh, you know, those containers sitting I mean, every day, yeah. you know, we're, we're shipping, you know, to 92 countries around the world. Fabulous. What, what do you look for when you're making bets on the people that you hire? Um, just, you know, going back to people that have integrity and, and they're just really hard workers and, and people that just really stand out. We have a great HR department and uh, sometimes I, I supersede um, there, uh, you know, I'll, I'll bring people to them that, uh, that I've been very successful with. I just feel good about people. Right. You know, we have one young man more recently that was, that was homeless in the streets of Salt Lake. And, uh, wow. and I watched him, you know, that from when he was 16 years old and then, um, his mother actually cut my, cuts my hair ah. and, uh, uh, <laughs> and she is, uh, Anyhow, she told me she followed up, you know, tough love. She, her son couldn't talk to her. Finally, she said, I think he's ready to work. You know, will you put him, can you put him to work? And I, and, and with that story and the feeling I had, I said, yes. So I go in and we had just hired, a, <laughs> we had just hired a new HR person a week before. Uh. And so I go to him and I said, I want you to hire this guy to work in production. And, and he said, okay. And so, but we, but we have, but we need to put him through the, 
you know, through the background the, check, yeah. the background check first, <laughs> and that'll take a couple of days and the drug tests and all this other stuff. And so I said, no, just hire him. So, <laughs> so he hires him and he hires Ben Drinkwater. And, and then um, the next day, next couple of days, or next day, actually, he got the, the background report. He said, we got to get rid of this oh, guy. Goodness. You know, here's a, he's got a three page rap sheet, Ugh. you know, all these felonies and, and car theft Ugh. and all this other stuff. He said, we can't have anybody working in this company like this. And I said, trust me. <laughs> he said, okay. Well, that was six years ago. Oh. And now, and he, right out of the shoot, he really stood out. This kid is brilliant. And so he said, do you have a manual on the CNC Sugami machines? And I said, no. But, at, you know, ask the engineers. Well, he got impatient. He got online. <laughs> he read the manuals. He learned how to program the, the Sugami machines. And now he runs the, he runs one shift wow. and does all the programming. And, and, uh, and he's, he's happily married and, and he's just a wonderful Fantastic. human being. And, Fantastic. and that really, and that started, and it actually started in, in uh, Campbell, California, on Walsh Avenue in our foundry, and or not on Walsh, but on Dell Avenue. And that's where I hired a guy. Um, his mother was driving him. Here's a guy who kidnapped his, his uh, um, he kidnapped his partner's uh, son and took him to the oh. zoo and he got arrested and put in jail because his, his partner, his ex-partner owed him $10,000. And so he takes his, he takes his son to the zoo and they were very good friends with the kid and took him to the zoo and ended up getting in jail for, uh, get put in jail in prison for 10 oh. years. Well, he got, he got out of jail and his mother, he was on the, uh, LDS has a great way of, um, uh, great way of taking care of their people as far as employment. And so we looked on the LDS, uh, or he was signed up on the, on, the, on the church employment thing, and his mother happened to have joined the, the LDS church when he, was a, when he was in prison. So she looks on there and finds, finds this job in, the, in, the, uh, in our foundry. And so she drives him to work, and this guy starts wow. working for us. He later became our manager of the foundry, and when we sold the foundry to a company to Sound Precision in Washington years later, um, he they and they and the lo, a local foundry guy who was a good friend of mine said, "Of all your employees, who should I hire?" And he was the only got, one that he that this other wow, guy hired. Fabulous. So anyhow, so he was he's one he's one of the first he's the first of five felons that I've hired, and they've all turned out to be very successful, including. Yeah. Ter- Cheerful Charlie, who was in your part of the world and did a, he was a, he was at a state planner and the IRS went after him as an example and he lost his million dollar oh. home in California back then. He moved to Utah 27 years ago and ran our, ran our machine shop. And once again, I thought, what? This guy's, and anyhow, Cheerful <laughs> Charlie, who plays a, a squeeze box and, and still entertains our, uh, or for years, even after he left our company, he continued to come in and play the his accordion for our Christmas parties. <laughs> so, oh, that's anyhow. fantastic. Well, Tom, last question, and then we're going to let you go. What career and life advice do you give, particularly to new college grads or, you know, folks that are starting out in their career and, you know, maybe aspire to, uh, like you, found companies and run them or maybe get to the, uh, the corner office themselves? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, just go get a job, you know, something that uh, and and learn how to work and work hard and find something you really love to do. Find a little niche, you know, in, in uh, um, something that you really enjoy. And, you know, if you find something that you really love, um, you never, you know, you <laughs> as they say, you never work a day in your life. Work a day in your life. <laughs> <laughs> so, really, and that's what I've been able to do. And I've been able to include my my children. I almost sold the company um, a couple of years ago, and we had this bad thing happen uh, right before that. And uh, you know, for two hundred twenty million, and that's without the buildings, which appraised for another twenty five million. And so. Um, and I decided, you know, no, I'm not going to do this because my my kids are involved, um, mm. and uh, you know, and just there's so many good people, and it just will be a different, um, it'll be a different world here at Blendtec. So, but I would say to these young people, you know, just 
you know, learn a skill and learn, yeah, um, just work really hard and, and, and save money. Don't just don't go blow your money away. And, uh, and then surround yourself, you know, with the very best people and, and lead out and take charge. And then when you are successful, share the wealth. You know, we've we've been very helpful in our community with the Museum of Natural Curiosity, with More Good Foundation. That's the one David Nealman actually founded and and sitting on that board with me um, is the founder of Word Perfect. Um, mm. And and um, uh, and so the, the, these are just the best people. And so that's the You know, find good friends now, you know, surround yourself in yeah. school and just find people that you can, I mean, look at these guys that I'm still involved with. You know, I, I gave, um, um, I gave Ken Woolley $17 million more recently for, for his hundred thousand dollar investment in blend tech. And, uh, then I turned around and, and, uh, after things kind of, we had some trouble and I called him up and said, Ken, I need uh, to borrow $3 million. <laughs> and, and Ken said, you should have called me yesterday. I just bought four 747s oh. for, for his airlines. <laughs> and so, oh, so, but, but he was able to go out and borrow $3 million for me and, and guarantee the loan for another $3 million. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so, you know, True it's friend. just, those are friends. And I taught him how to drive in the seventh grade around my racetrack. And yeah. right. Yeah. Right. Well, Tom Dixon, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. You've been extremely generous. We've got lots of good stories here. You've had a a tremendous impact on just so many people, too, you know, and that's so uh, enlightening uh, to be able to see and recognize and how you've changed people's lives. And uh, I want to thank you for your service, as well as obviously uh, the success that you've had. And it's just been a pleasure hearing your story. And uh, we'll look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. All the best. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. 